This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. Thank you to Campaign Sidekick for supporting the podcast. Visit campaignsidekick.vote to find out how their best-in-breed voter contact platform can revolutionize your campaign and help you win. Today, we're talking to Montana State Representative Daniel Zolnikov. He just started his third term in the Big Sky State's legislature and is only 29 years old. Daniel is a liberty-minded Republican representing Billings House District 45, where he focuses much of his energy on promoting gun rights, civil liberties, limited government, and economic freedom. All issues that are very near and dear to my heart. He's been recognized in Forbes magazine, 30 under 30 policymakers in the nation, and Red Alert Politics touted him as one of the top 30 conservatives under 30. Daniel's name has also been kicked around as a potential replacement for Congressman Zinke, who was recently tapped by President-elect Trump to lead the Department of the Interior. Having legislators under 30 is rare enough, but the fact that he's in his third term and still hasn't crossed over 30, and he's only 29 at this point, is even more impressive. What I think is even better than that is Daniel's drive on and off the campaign trail. He's a hard worker and focuses on talking directly with his constituents. Representative, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. Well, it was great getting to know a little bit more about you through our previous conversations and and Gabby Hoffman's interview with you over at The Resurgent. That kind of brought you to my attention and really piqued my my curiosity about you and wanted to get to know you a little bit better. And I'm really glad you're, you're getting to come on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's nice uh, understanding your background as well. It seems like a very well-rounded, diverse approach to campaigning, something I actually don't see very often and something that needs to be taken advantage of more often. Well, I appreciate that. It's it's really interesting hearing from different candidates and consultants trying to get their take on campaigns, seeing what's the similar and different between all these different takes. And, And yours, obviously, particularly being in a you know, being up there in Montana, being as young as you are and having such a great impact up there in the legislature, it's great to have you on. Now, s- start talking with us a little bit about how your early life helped introduce you to politics and what your background was before you got into running for office. So I would say just to start out, because I know some people come from pretty political backgrounds and I see that quite often. I came, I did not come from a political background. I was a born in Oregon and my family moved to Montana when I was seven. So, I mean, I remember only Montana. I was was Montana as you come, but we didn't have any connection really to the state or anybody uh, here in Montana. So in just starting out, even in uh, junior high and early high school, I was running for a class president. I went to one of those really small rural schools with a graduating class of 47, you know, there's (laughs) literally literally more cows than people of where I'm from in a 50 mile radius. Um, so that was, that was where I came from. I was just very interested in doing something that's always been a driver for me. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't as much driven by, uh, grades or, uh, uh, I don't know, things like that. I, I wanted to have an impact. It was just something inside of me that made me move forward. So I ran for class president, ran for class president, ran for student body president, you know, in college I ran for Senate uh, for a student body, like things along those lines. Uh, I was just involved at a very young age. That's pretty neat. So at what point did you start to get involved in politics as far as moving away from the uh, the student body type stuff and getting more interested in state and federal politics? So obviously it, it came onto my radar uh, when I was in high school. I didn't run for it at that point, obviously too young, but I realized at a pretty young age, or I'd say by 16 or 17, that I could, and this was in government class, that I could actually run for an office in Montana, and if I worked hard enough, I could win it for a, like a House seat or a Senate seat. And we have a smaller House districts, so I could literally, if I wanted to, knock on enough doors and uh, ask for enough votes to win it. And it was, in, it was just one day in class, I was paying attention. And I realized, oh, I, I can do this. And once I have something on my mind, I do it. So it may have taken eight years after I realized that, but I ended up doing it about 25. <laughs> I love it. Now, in, you're talking about small house districts. In this case, you, for you, that's less than 5,500 to 6,000 votes in, in the general election for, for this seat, right? Definitely. 
So that, like you said, that's a number that you know you can go out there and knock yourself, and, and you actually have several times. As it turns out. Yeah, I've done it. So I just won my third uh, campaign, and I've done it. The first campaign I knocked for five months, and I was against somebody who taught and uh, coached in the district for 25 years, and that was longer than I had been alive. So I I knocked doors. And I did not mess around. I mean, I knocked doors. It was all of my priority in life was to knock, 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 and just talk to voters constantly. Um, I did 24 days in a row until I took a break uh, at one point. I wanted to win. (laughs) So, and then the next campaign, I did uh, three months uh, because I only had a general opponent and my seat was redistricted, got a little conservative, but I still knocked like basically all the doors. And then this last campaign, I knocked doors for four months. So, in the last wow. five years, I've spent one year of my life knocking doors. It's crazy. For any of the listeners that have been been with us for a while and hear me harping on the power of door knocking every single week, that's uh, this is absolutely music to my ears. And one of the things that I, I first latched onto when I was reading Gabby's interview with you is just how passionate you are about talking directly to your voters and building those relationships. And that's something that you know a small minority of politicians actually do, but it's so incredibly effective. That seems to, from our conversation, have been a large part of what you know, really got people behind you and how you're able to win a, a house seat at 25 years old. Yeah, there was, there, it was a huge impact. I had people, I, had, I mean, it was, this was, of course, during the Obama-Romney election as well. So, you know, everybody's talking about national stuff, but I literally had people, like, hug me my first campaign around because I was much younger than the average politician. I was just different. People wanted something different. So... It was funny because uh, there's the standard, there's the status quo of a good candidate, but I think it's changing where people want something almost abnormal, as you could see with this recent presidential election. People want different, and different is not bad anymore. So, yeah, it was quite the, I did not realize it till later, but it was very helpful. You raise a good point. And I think that's that to today's elections, the voters are asking for different things than they were 10, 15 years ago. We want a different type of politician, and, and it can range anywhere from a Donald Trump to somebody like yourself. And one of the most important things, as I think it's part of it has to do with these with social media and having more information about the people and their backgrounds, right? The people that are running for these offices. And it's always been the case that people cared more about whether they liked the politician, they liked the person they were voting for, had it, thought that they were a good person than you know lining up with 100% of their political beliefs. But more and more, as individuals are more accessible, at least online, if not in person, it matters more who the person is and whether they like you. And for you, being able to get out there and meet these people at their door, they got to see who you were, understand and ask you questions and, and know your motivations for running what you cared about and were going to fight for. And you got to learn the same things about them. And that's that kind of reciprocity of a relationship is very rare. But you drove that home in a pretty profound way, it seems. Yeah, I I think I learned honestly more from talking to voters, and it wasn't. I, mean, I obviously had my political beliefs, but understanding like how they looked at things and what their major concerns were and why made it me able to apply my politics in a way that most voters could understand. So one thing I keep running into is a lot of uh, politicians speak to the base, and they don't speak to the general population, who is the average, you know, quote unquote voter. They're they're the they're the uh, the typical person who has a very busy life and isn't as involved in politics, but they end up voting, and that's the majority of voters. So talking to those folks daily for hours on end was really helpful. And the other thing I did was when I had a conversation, I never cut somebody off to go to the next door. Um, I let them talk to me. And sometimes I had a few that talked, you know, like pretty long. Um, <laughs> like I'm talking half hour, hour. Right. Like, and the, you know, I, I was never rude to them, though, and I listened Good. to them have a conversation, and uh, it wasn't like, oh, I got four and a half minutes per door, and anything over seven is a waste of another vote I could have got. It was like, no, I'm going to talk to this person, and you'd be amazed how much people appreciated that. They were like, well, I should let you go. I'm like, no, like, you're who I'm here to talk to, so let's talk, and that's probably why it took me so long to get through my district, but I think it was, it was really helpful from both angles. They knew me and I knew them. Well, and having that attitude of that there's that there's nobody more important than that person in front of you is so huge. Because that's one of my biggest pet peeves with a lot of politicians is if I'm at an event and I'm watching somebody and they're 
you know, they're shaking hands and kissing babies, but they're always looking over the shoulder of the person they're talking to. They're looking for the bigger wallet, the bigger name, the person that could do more for them than the person they're actually engaging with. That tells me that they don't actually care about that person they're talking to. And that's, you know, whether it's clear, you know, subliminally or not to the individual that they're communicating with, it comes across. But you know, one of our mutual friends, Ted Cruz, having worked with him for a long time, one of the biggest things I admire about him and one of the hardest things when I was actually staffing him and actually trying to keep us on schedule was that he did the same thing. He, you know, there was nobody outside of the person that he was talking to directly that he cared about. It, he was solely focused on that individual. And you taking that same attitude with your constituents, I have no doubt has done a lot to really increase the intimacy of y'all's relationship. And it does it goes a long way to help and make sure that you keep their votes, that you get them every two years. Yeah, and, and honestly, the other side of it is it really is my job to like be able to listen to people. And Absolutely. Disagree, disagree, but listen to them full-heartedly. Um, and I'll tell you one other thing. Like Again, knocking on doors, especially that first campaign, four hours in the evenings and then eight-hour days on the weekends. Um, I remember once knocking on a door and someone's like, dude, it's Friday afternoon. Like, What are you doing? I'm like, I had no idea what day of the week it was because – I had one priority, and <laughs> I, I, I'm known for being a pretty fun person who likes to have drinks on weekends, and uh, man, that was more important than having a good time at that point. But one thing about paying attention and talking to people was it can be exhausting. I mean, it, it, if you really listen and like look at someone and listen to them and tr like pay attention, it, it, it takes a lot of mental effort. So after I, I got done talking to people, I would be, I'd be exhausted. And then I'd go out and do it again. But I, but that's like kind of the price you pay to actually listen. Yeah, there are far too many people that when they start running for a political office, they don't understand what that's like. And they don't really understand how much time or how much effort it's going to take. And the great thing is, like, like you prove, this is not an impossible task, but it does take a high level of drive. You have to be convicted about what you're doing. And it really has to be for more than just your own you know, personal aggrandizement. I mean, because that's not going to carry you through you know, all those hours and days and weeks of walking straight. Because if all you care about is getting a nice office and a title, I'm sorry, I, it's hard for me to imagine that people are going to walk all those doors and spend all that time out there busting their butt to get that kind of title. Well, let me just sum up this before we move on, because we can talk about knocking doors all day since I've literally done it so much, is that a lot of candidates think that they have to preach to the to the uh, to the voters, and really, you don't. Like, if the the thing is, voters, especially in today's political climate, don't feel like they're being listened to because really, they're not. So, if you can ask questions and engage and listen to them, you'd be surprised how people just want somebody they can share and talk with and like share their thoughts. They don't want to hear you preach to them and then like leave because then they didn't tell you anything they're thinking about. So the most important thing I learned was literally. Uh, engage in a conversation, but ask questions. Don't expect to lecture people. That was a huge. That was a huge thing as well. So, yeah, you're there to ask for their vote ultimately. But just like any friend, if you're just if you just show up every time to ask for a favor or to tell them what they're doing wrong or what they should do, that's not going to be much of a friend, and you're probably not going to be somebody they want to hang out with. Showing up exactly. and asking them though what they care about, what bothers them about their government, what do they think should be done. I mean. Just think about when the last time somebody with no ulterior motives or they weren't trying to preach to you, they just ask you, hey, what do you think about this? And it's probably fairly rare. But if you go and ask them those genuine questions, you're going to have some people that have a lot of good feedback for you. And you're going to feel like you know them a lot better at the end of that conversation. Perfect. Now, exactly. I, would, I would imagine that through that process, not only did you get a, you know, get a lot of good relationships built that led to votes, but... You also probably got a lot of good information about marketing and how you could better market to your voters and better go out there and get those votes on a broader basis. Is that right? That was that is a great point. Um, I have a marketing degree and an information systems degree, and I learned a lot from talking about talking to people because you know voters basically are my clientele. Having spoken to voters for so long, you kind of learn how they look at issues, and that makes me it makes it easier for me to communicate with them. With my background, I got an information systems degree and a marketing degree, also a management degree. But the marketing one was really important because I learned how to communicate with different mediums and kind of different approaches. And I would never have known that without talking to voters for so long, really figuring out what drives them. Like 
sometimes we go too far in the details. Sometimes we think, oh, we're going to preach about um, a big tax break when really they've heard so much of the same political rhetoric over and over while I'm serving that they actually want to hear something positive throughout all the negative and the positive can shine through. Or they want to hear like, like what we're working on, what, what's going to make their life better in a way that's applicable. Talking to voters helped me learn how to better communicate with them because I had so many conversations with them. Um, and then with my information systems degree background, I learned how to do that through digital um, mediums, basically social media, especially Facebook and Twitter a little bit, but a lot more on Facebook to be able to talk about things that were relevant to their lives, not relevant to my life. It, it, made a, it has made a huge impact. That's something that I think a lot of people saw the truth of this year with Donald Trump's election, was that it was fueled by a lot of people in D.C. that had not been answering the true concerns of a lot of voters. And a lot of people were surprised by that. I, I was frankly surprised that he actually got elected. I, I didn't think that was going to happen. But he was really carried on the backs of a lot of people that wanted something truly different. They wanted to feel like they were heard. And they felt like, you know, whether truly or not, that you know, President-elect Trump actually heard that and that he truly understood a lot of their concerns. And it seems like in a lot of ways that you identified you know, that problem because you were talking to these guys. You were out there with them on a daily basis. And that was a, a huge help to your campaign because on that first one, you won that by less than 1,000 votes, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and now, I mean, you've because you've built those relationships and you continue to run as a conservative and represent them, you know, true to what you tell them on the campaign trail, your, your win margin has gone way, way up. Yeah, it has it has definitely increased a lot, and uh, and I mean even I had a I had to do some pretty liberty legislation, so I had a pretty nasty primary, and it was people. I mean in the in the political sphere, people were like, oh, we don't know what's going to happen, but I mean I knocked on doors and I had support, a lot of support of people. I won that with a vote of two to one, and there was a lot of money being nice. spent. Yeah, and it was just like. And it's funny because in Helena, our capital, the the word was like, oh, this might be tough for Daniel. But on the street where I was knocking doors, I had a ton of support. People were like, I remember talking to you for 20 minutes four years ago. I remember talking to you two years ago. I read your op-eds in the paper. I hear, you know, you doing this interview in the morning shows. Like, because I literally made it my job to put myself out there as much as possible and talk about things that are relevant. Talk about my Russian background. Talk about having a drink at the bar or a few with my friends. Um, you know what's funny? One of the most relevant political issues that came up in the last year in Montana had nothing to do with taxes or guns or even my um, some of my legislation to do with privacy rights, which I'm known for. It was how I co or I sponsored I carried a bill in the house to make Uber to help legalize Uber basically to, to simplify the issue. Yeah. And that got more eyes and more support than anything else. It had and no one political polling wise would ever be like, oh Uber's gonna be big, but really that was more than any tax cut we got to the governor's desk. That was more than the budget it was literally so relevant to everybody's life to be able to go out and get a safe ride home. That's awesome. Well, and that brings up a couple of points in my mind. One is that your ability and that marketing background, you, you know how many touches somebody needs to have before they really start remembering you and feel like they have a strong connection there. And by being out there on all these different mediums, not just having Facebook and that's all that you ever do, but by being out there with your op-eds and the interviews and Facebook and Twitter and being out there talking to folks, they're able to see you all over the place and really get to know you on a different level from a marketing perspective. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. And then you put the chair on top of actually talking to them on the door. And it's just, I think it just completes the whole thing that you're a real person who's there to talk to them. One thing I did do, I, I of course, like every candidate, have a little handout um, that I give. And I'm, I'm not going to lie, I helped design my handout, and I think it's literally one of the best ones I've ever seen. But uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's simple, it's to the point. I mean, there's like one word issues, and it's just like I have, it, I think it's a very well designed piece. And one of the things I did this time was make my contact information even larger. It's got my email, my Twitter, my Facebook, and it's got my cell phone on it. And I point to people, say, hey, if you want to contact me, here's how you contact me. It's my personal cell phone. And you know what? Not many people contact me, but knowing that they have the opportunity to means that I'm actually accessible and there for them. And that is like it's like a guarantee or a reassurance that is it's true. I'll answer that phone call. And it really makes people, I think, uh, it, it makes them believe in you or believe that you're actually there for them. Yeah, that's just transparency. I mean, they want to be able to know that they can reach out to somebody that represents them. And especially given how hard it is to reach most elected representatives, 
I mean, your willingness to do that, put your name, your number, all the information out there is huge. Yeah. But, and I really appreciate that your your dedication in running those races, even when you don't think that they're going to be a huge battle. Uh, I mean, I, my philosophy is there's two ways to run a campaign. There's scared or there's unopposed. And you've done a good <laughs> job. Uh, even when even when you weren't really scared, that you worked hard. You didn't take their votes for granted. And I think that voters appreciate that. They want to know that you're, they want to know that their vote matters to you and that you care about them. And just taking them for granted and sitting back on your, you know, your laurels and not get wearing out those shoes, pounding the pavement, that's, uh, you know, that doesn't breed a whole lot of respect from their perspective. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, you mentioned your Russian heritage. Your dad's family fled Stalinist Russia, right? Yes. Uh, I, th- I believe I was in the uh, early 30s. And so they were they were definitely like czarist Russians. And then over time, especially as you may or may not know, Stalin killed a lot of Russians. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, millions. They, millions. And they were just there were lists of like who was next and who were threats and who were political threats. I mean, he killed like some of the closest people around him because they were possible threats. It was it was crazy. And so they were on this list and um. It, it, the most interesting part of that story was the night before they were supposed to basically get all killed, they had a friend in the um, in the the Red Army, basically the Communist Army, that told them that they are going to be taken out the next day. So they had to like wow. evacuate that night, and um, and I'm not sure how they ended up, but they ended up making it to Iran or Iran, however you want to say it, and uh, spent like over a, a decade there um wow. so that's the youngest of 12 and he ended up being born right before they got a refugee status and came to the usa crazy that yeah iran was better than russia right yeah yeah i guess back in the uh i guess what would that have been the, the late 30s early 40s when they were refugees there yep yep in the early 40s is when they uh or probably probably close to the mid 40s is when they uh came to the U.S. My dad actually doesn't have a birth certificate, believe it or not, because he was <laughs> born over there. I mean, he he, he was yeah. raised like me, and being raised in Montana, being born in Oregon, he was raised in um in in the USA. So I mean, very obviously very American. But his siblings, a lot of them who are older, um, much older, they spoke Russian first and Farsi second and English third. It is kind of crazy. That is crazy. Now I would imagine that. That story and that background, I mean, how did that influence some of some of your growing up and some of the you know, the political evolution that you went through? Well, I think being Russian alone, you um, over time question things more and more and more. I don't know if it's uh, just just a stereotype I'm replying, but I think there might be a little <laughs> bit of cynicism there. You kind of question everything and agendas and why 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 we're in the world where we are in. Um, but yeah, you you hear about these stories about how this actually affected your family, and you read books on how. Right. Um, this let's just let's just take from some and give to others. It it's funny because it's like okay, that really sounds like a great theory until you realize there's these people called the ones who take it and redistribute it, and they then <laughs> want the power and get it. Like right. there's always these little factors we forget about. These really good fairy tales of uh, you know there's usually a there's usually a hand that moves the pieces, and whoever is in mm-hmm. control of that hand is in control. And there's a lot of unintended consequences or unseen consequences that result from some of those, you know, great ideas that people try to throw out there. The the, the oh, it's crazy. Those like we don't talk about them enough. Like this is history. No, like, no this we is don't. With my family, like this isn't, this isn't, and like okay, the world's changed. I'll never happen again. It's happening in countries right now, and we forget that we are all human beings with human nature, and like we gotta those. If we forget about what happened, it's really likely to happen again. Gabby and I talked about this. Gabby Hoffman, who interviewed for you for the resurgent, you know, we talked a lot about this, given her family's background, fleeing communism as well. And there's just, especially in our generation, you know, we weren't alive in order to at least don't remember the Soviet Union. I mean, that was not a factor in our school age growing up and, and the world that we lived in. We didn't live with that fear, and you know, we sure don't know a whole lot of people who fled themselves. And so it's it's something that is really receding quickly into the back of our minds. And it's it's sad because I think, like you said, there's you know, there are a few things that actually change about who people are. Human nature is is not that malleable, and there's still people out there that are bad folks with bad motives. And if we forget 
how those people act and what the consequences of allowing them to have power are, man, we're going to repeat those same freaking mistakes year in, year out. And, and that is why I'm such a big person on like privacy rights and some of these civil liberties things because we need to check some balances of government. It's not not saying like there's always the freedom versus security argument, but I'm a big checks and balances because if you give too much power to one person, they will abuse it unless they know that they're being overseen. It is just it is just something that has happened over and over and over and over again. And that's why I preach it. And I get a lot of support from people on some of my issues. Um, I mean, like, I bring up the example that J. Edgar Hoover was literally blackmailing Martin Luther King back in the day with, like, with like um, recordings of him cheating on his wife. And he was trying to derail the whole civil rights movement, like J. Edgar Hoover was. That was within our own government. J. Edgar Hoover was blackmailing politicians to vote a certain way. Like, this has happened here. I tell people this, and they don't even – they, like, are – amazed that this happened like <laughs> right our, our parents literally growing up had to do bomb drills of a nuclear bomb dropped like this is this is relevant this is pretty recent history you know yeah but it's not something that we think about or that i think most people conceive of the possibility of this happening again but if we don't remember it if we don't allow it to impact the way that we act politically and personally then it it could yeah hey man i'm with you <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about how some of these major issues evolve for you, because among them, you know, privacy and civil liberties is one of your, your core focal points for what you're doing there in Montana. And for a lot of people, that didn't really pop back to the forefront until after you know, WikiLeaks and Snowden started to be you know, on the headlines. But for you, that was a, something you were working on and passing legislation on in advance of those becoming kind of vogue topics, right? Yes. Yeah, it was uh, it was. A little bit of luck and a little bit of having friends in the right places. Of uh, I had a friend from college. Literally, I ran against him for student body president of my college, and then we I got second, he got third, so we both lost. And <laughs> the, he, the losers he, became the, friends. Yeah, exa- exactly. And <laughs> I literally hung out with him like the other day, so we're still friends. <laughs> That's great. He, he was a hacker. Um, is a hacker like a, a good hacker, not a bad hacker. Yeah, white hat. And so, yeah, exactly. And and uh, we actually spoke at DEF CON together, but before that, he was the one who turned me on to these privacy issues on how our digital communications don't belong to us and there's no checks and balances. So really just from having friends that I still communicate with who are relatively normal people, um, he got me on this issue. And, and like our data, who does it belong to? How can it be obtained? Why is there no warrant process? How can it be used against people in the future? How much data are we collecting? All this crazy stuff like that. Um, so it kind of got me and got me on this path of now I am known as the privacy guy. Any technology bills come up, even if it's not privacy, legislators are asking me about it from both sides of the aisle. It's amazing. I think that's one of the cool things about you being a millennial because these these are true 21st century issues, and you're not going to have some 45 year old guy or your 65 year old legislator who has a best friend that's a hacker that understands and can be ahead of the curve on these privacy issues. <laughs> that's just not going to happen. But because of who you are, the age and the background that you have, that was something that popped onto your radar. Yep, exactly. I I can't agree with you more. I have more friends. I, mean, I have friends who obviously. Uh, we're all about the same age, some a little bit younger, some a little bit older, but some of them have, you know, they've had rougher lives and they've gone in trouble in the background. I get to know some of these people like in a personal experience. It's like, you know, oh, politically, I don't want to be connected with that guy. My perspective is that is the normal guy. You know, everybody's gone through something hard. Everybody's done a challenge. I see more into their life. and I actually get, you know, a, a real perspective versus a, um, I don't know if elitist is the right one, but one of it's like, well, I can't communicate with those people because they don't have the proper background like most <laughs> right. of my friends have like sleeves and tattoos i don't have any but like it's just it's just that is the normal these days that's just that is acceptable in, in i guess my world well too many people as politicians they try to pretend like they're perfect you know and they they try to hide their background hide any baggage and you, know, we, you and I know both because of the privacy issues just because of how free people are with a lot of their information and that's changing I mean, there's there's gonna be more and more people with you know pictures of frat parties and stuff like that coming out on Facebook and being on Oppo mailers and stuff like that. It's gonna happen. You know, we've seen examples of that. You don't have it's to. It's really funny. When I first ran, one of my I thought I hit all my like or you know like yeah basically hid the Facebook photos that were bad. And someone's like, um, have you seen yours? So I didn't do a good job of that. And like one of them was <laughs> videoing 
pig stand, um, like, I don't know, one of my birthday parties. And, like, I don't yeah. Like, because I went to college, and I will tell you, and I've told everybody this, I had a great time in college. Like, right. I can make a good drink, and I can, you know, I can drink a good beer, and I can beat most people at beer pong. So I had, I had a great time, and I'll admit it because it's true. And you know what? So did everybody else. Most people had oh, a great yeah. time in college. It's not like I'm this outlier crazy guy. I'm just wild because I actually admit it. And it's, it's crazy. Well, and I think people respect that because you're like, look, I've got. I've had fun. I haven't gone out and committed a bunch of felonies. I haven't broken laws. I haven't done, you know, but I've enjoyed my life and I'm okay with that. I'm not going to try to hide that or pretend that I'm some, you know, I don't know, some perfect individual. I, I fail to think that that, I really don't think that exists. It doesn't. And people realize, especially voters, when you're going to go talk to them and be open about that you're a normal guy, I think that's a huge help in getting their confidence and you know, they can actually trust you more because even if they don't know what your background is or what skeletons might be there or who you might be when you're not having your politician suit on, they assume that you're a human being. And if you try to pretend that you're not, that you're perfect, they're going to know that you're lying to them right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. And again, and you mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation that we, um, as human beings can read each other really well, like unknowingly, like if, if you're looking past somebody, they know it. They may not fully like have seen it and thought about it, but they just you like lose points immediately if you're looking past them or how you're treating them or talking down to them or not listening to them or ignoring them. And so that's that goes the same. If you're like pretend to be a lie or like pre- basically pretend to be perfect, which the uh, only perfect people I've ever met have been usually pretty boring anyway. Like <laughs> they, they can see right through it. Right. You know. Let's go over and talk about the fundraising side, because in Montana, you guys have a, a pretty interesting system. In Texas, we don't have donation caps on state-level elections. So state house on up can give as, get as big a check as you want. In Montana, you guys don't allow that. And you, you recently raised the limits, but you know, previously, in the first couple races you had, what was it, 100-some dollars was the max? 170, yes. So max of $170 per person for primary and for general, is that right? Uh, yes. So, I mean, very, very low donation amounts. And you know, that changes the game. It's a, it's a different fundraising game here versus there. How did you go about you know, kind of building your fundraising strategy and raising the money you needed to be competitive and win these races? So my first time, I was, of course, uh, I said I was 25. So I had gone out of college a few years ago. Most of my friends weren't very, uh, they, they, they were either in college or just getting done. So they didn't have a lot of money. And so, and I'm not from a very wealthy area. I'm not from a wealthy family and like none of that. So my connections were pretty limited. Um, it was interesting. Once people realized I was knocking those doors pretty hard, there were, there was, there was this, there's a rumor effect I've seen in politics that if they think, if people think you can win this seat, then, uh, there's going to be a spotlight on your race. So that was, that was yep, helpful. Absolutely true. Um, and so it's basically you got to prove that you're a worthy candidate and then you get a little bit of approval. The other one was, um, having low donation limits was beneficial for me because I could get 50 bucks or a hundred bucks and my grandma could donate to me and it was impactful. You know, I didn't need 170 from her, but if I got a hundred dollars from her, hundred, you know, maybe 170 from my uncle and, uh, everybody threw in a little bit, it added up really quick, especially, with our lower voter um, turnout because we have smaller districts, so maybe like maybe not lower voter turnout, but we had smaller amounts of people voting. Um, it didn't take a lot of money; it just took a little bit of money from a lot of people, and so that grew into my second campaign, and it grew even more into my third campaign. Where pretty soon, um, just a lot of people gave me hundred dollars, fifty dollars, hundred fifty, whatever, and it added up to. I think I raised over thirty thousand dollars that time, which at one hundred seventy dollars a pop was pretty good. Now, partially through this last campaign, our um, donation limits actually got boosted to three thirty because it was they were so they were actually considered unconstitutionally low. But I still got a hundred hundred fifty dollars. Like a few people gave three thirty, but most people is still small amounts. So I raised a lot more than almost any other candidate for the House or Senate in my state. Wow, that's really impressive, and. What did you do with that money? So, I mean, you had like, what, a $30,000 budget for the first race? Uh, so that was for both of them. Uh, okay, so primary in general? 
Yeah, and and I wasn't clear, so it, it was one hundred seventy dollars for the primary, and I could re-raise it for the general. But if I didn't have a primary, I could only raise one hundred seventy dollars. So gotcha. a little confusing. And then when they changed it, it was three hundred thirty dollars total. So, um, for so if I for all for both the primary and the general. So I actually lost the ability to raise money with the increase in cap. As crazy as that is, um, it, it was it was it was a weird situation. So we don't have to worry about the details. Uh, but I did, I did not want to lose my primary. I was afraid there was going to be tens of thousands of dollars being spent against me from some special interest that I will not name. Since it's, <laughs> you know, don't need to bring up those, uh, those old fights, but there was money spent against me. Not as much as I thought there would be still, I don't know, probably roughly 10,000, not including the opponent. Uh, so I did an intense campaign. I did, of course, door knocking. That's the fundamental one. And then I did, uh, and then I did mail pieces, and I matched those with social media targeted at my district. And then there was, and then I also had um, extra money, so I did radio, which didn't really make sense, except that maybe I could bring people on my side um, or get other people across the, the the city on my side, which can help because it seems everybody's kind of connected. Mm-hmm. So I didn't see it as a negative. I'm not sure if it's as much of a positive uh, because there's a whole bunch of house districts in my city. So I'd only be reaching some of my voters, but it'd be the base of the base listening to those stations. Um, and then the most amazing thing about the radio was opposition came in through the radio. So I felt like for me spending positively, it wasn't bad. It may have not been great, but I wanted to try a different medium too because of my marketing. I'm always curious. I'm trying things and getting right. feedback. But their negative spending against me seemed to be really wasted because it was like spread so thin. <laughs> so I I'm not sure if, you, if you're really following along. Like, like one thing could be more positive than negative. But I was yeah. really bewildered by how much they were spending on me on radio. It didn't make sense to me, and it wasn't even a targeted um, radio station. It was it was like a music station versus a talk radio one. So I was just blown away by how much money was being literally wasted in opposition to me. Well, that's one of the nice things when you have you know, poorly educated, inefficient enemies. Because <laughs> you know, like you talked about, you know, part of the reason why you put that as the last item on your budget, the one that was kind of a, the, the last if you had some extra money, because it, was, it wasn't targeted and it was of unknown impact, right? So you could test it with some extra money at the end. But for them, it sounds like that was their primary tool. So they were using primary tool. Their big one was an untargeted you know, or at least poorly targeted form of communication that wasn't reaching out to the specific voters. Whereas exactly. you, your primary tone is you're going out to the specific voters who you knew were going to vote and you were talking to them personally. And that kind of asymmetrical advantage is in the type of warfare politically you were waging gave you a huge advantage. So I know that you are a big one on um, volunteers and I actually, so it took me three campaigns to do it, but this time I actually paid people uh, to do phone calls for me. Because yeah. I had I'd raised enough money. I literally had a lot of extra money. I um, I mean, for for how much our resources cost, uh, and so I, I paid people to do phone calls and go through the entire list of my district and go through the, the phones, and that was just one more personal touch that I, I just um, I thought was really impactful. I also did huge campaign signs because um, I don't know because my mom really likes. <laughs> <laughs> having some of those out to make mom happy. That's, that's actually probably the best reason I've heard of for having large campaign signs. My mom well, the, likes you know them. That you, it's, it's like such a big political debate on campaign signs. Is, oh, uh, yeah. Helpful or not. And I feel like they're helpful for people who know me. So if I meet somebody, they'll see the sign and then they'll notice it. But no one who's, someone who's never met me never notices the sign. And... The one thing about it, though, is my last name is weird and strange and has a Z and a V and some letters in between. Yeah, mainly uh, consonants. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. And so, like, that actually, I'm, I'm very curious because it's so obscure that it might have caught more attention. But, yeah, it's funny because I don't get in the whole science, are they worth it or not debate. I just feel like they kind of there to make the candidate or the candidate's mother happy. Um, yeah. There's ways to use the money. And I think people... Use, like from what I saw, using it for people and ground game is probably the best use of money. And I would have changed it if I knew. I mean, my campaign worked out, but next time, ground game, completely all the way. 
you're doing exactly right from my perspective. I'm kind of in the same boat. I don't really have a dog in the hunt when it comes to signs. I'm just like, look, as long as your your primary means of voter contact, your door to door, your phone banking, those types of things are are well funded, they're fully funded, and you're confident they don't, they're not going to need some extra dollars in the end. Sure, go get some yard signs because you can make your mom happy. Yeah, they really do primarily have an effect as far as the morale, right? They can either depress your opponent because you got so many of them out there that they think you've you've won this thing and wrapped it up already, or right. they can you know make you happy because you know or and your team happy because they see oh we're doing great. But I'm not I'm not a huge fan of yard signs. I think they're the other thing is they take up so much time, especially if you don't have a lot of volunteers like me. Like right. I do a lot of stuff on my own. I have help, um, strategic help, but I do a lot. Of it. I do a lot of it on my own. Um, something probably about that school hard knocks of a, you know, better just do it on my own, right? And, right. Uh, and signs take up. I I stopped basically doing the little signs. I did the big signs. I did twelve of them. It takes a day. Me and my dad did them, um, put them up, and then call it good. But the little signs is so much upkeep. You gotta move them around and check if they're stolen. Cause my first campaign, I had hundreds of little signs up, and they were. One block, my opponent had his signs up, and all mine were gone. And it just happened over and over like that. So much upkeep. I should have been knocking doors, not worrying about signs. So, I agree 100% with your outlook on that. It's a, It can be a huge time waster. Now, you, you mentioned the strategic help side. What does your campaign operation look like? Do you have like a general consultant and different vendors you work with, or do you handle most of that yourself? What does is, what is your campaign setup look like? Um, I have vendors, specific vendors for specific outlets, uh, especially I would say mail. Um, I know there's also like political philosophy on mail either. I just uh, could I could afford to do it, so I did it, and I did it well. Uh, I, I believe like I did mail for all my campaigns, and this one was I thought some of the best best mail I've ever seen, and I mean it. Like, and they they were very efficient and effective. My name was big on there. That was the biggest. <laughs> it's good. My name on there. Not very many words, but a lot of um, just a few lines for the issue, a few lines about the issue. I mean, like eight word sentences, mm-hmm. and then my name and my name and basically who I was. That's perfect. Yeah, it was. I and the the pictures were very bright, and so I was very happy about that. Um, and then, but other than that, I had people. I just have a lot of friends. So one benefit of being younger in politics is my friends are uh, they work behind the scenes they're the guys who are working on campaigns all across the state so right i can literally contact any of my friends and they had done it before it wasn't like some random person who has an opinion it's like no we've done thousands of phone calls tens of thousands of phone calls we've knocked tens of thousands of doors over the last like 10 years we've done this we've done that like i didn't have to reinvent the wheel and so i could talk to them and it was really helpful to have that group of people in my life so once you actually got elected i know a lot of folks they they run for office and then they get elected and they're like holy crap they're just the dog that caught the car uh, <laughs> it seems like it seems like you had a little bit better appreciation of what you're getting into at that point but it, i'm sure there was still a lot of stuff you learned but you know, how was that going from i mean you're a 25 year old just guy like to say the house you're going in now you're in charge of filing legislation establishing priorities you know your parliamentary duties Plus, you're hiring a staff in an office that's going to serve your constituents. Talk me through a little bit of that process and you know, how you did that. Well, actually, our staff is just legislative staff, so still a lot of what I do is myself. Okay, so, so you don't have a personal staff there in the Capitol? Uh, no, we have staff for our committees, and then we have legislative staff for our bills and things along those lines. But like my, I do everything. I am. I literally have bills here. I have constituents I respond to. Like I left the office, whatever, at nine last night. I do everything, and I try to do it extremely well. And so, it's a very, I would say, old school structure. And it takes a lot of time to do it well. I'm doing thirty bills. I'm chairing this committee with all these bills, and I am negotiating the bills. Like, this is. Um, I would say if you pull a Montana into Congress, we're going to know more about what's going on because we've done everything. <laughs> no kidding. That's that's very, insane, very impressive. Right? Oh, yeah. That's insane. That's pretty crazy, especially compared to you know, in Texas. You know, we have we have you know, much bigger districts. Um, we have a lot more people. We have a lot you know, fewer uh, representatives you know, per uh, you know, across the state. But it's uh, you know, it's you have staff, you have district staff, you have your personal staff in the Capitol. Uh, you know, it's it's a much bigger operation. But 
you know, in your case, I love that old school side to it. It's, it seems very much you know, like a very Montana way to do it. <laughs> that's about, that's right. <laughs> doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just that you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, that's very, funny. very Montana. <laughs> that's, yeah, funny. that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's tiring though, because like if I had resources, man, I could do so much more. Um, like right. literally before the session, but after the election, I was calling companies because uh, we have these coal plants shutting down. I was trying to say, okay, we're looking for new people coming to the state. Like, what is what is the barrier to entry? What are you looking at? Why would you? Why wouldn't you? Is there anything? Are there law barriers? Like, what can we do? As and I was the guy calling them. Like, I was <laughs> yeah. the staffer. I was the guy reaching out to these companies that testified in front of us before, saying just what what would make it what would make Montana friendly or things along those lines. Um, I mean, all the conversations are like that. I meet with the main people of departments all the time. Um, and then I go and in the afternoon I chair my committee where we're doing a lot of energy stuff. Like it's insane. It is, it is overwhelming. This is my third term and I feel like I've got my feet on the ground pretty well. There was a, I mean, bills come up and I can read them and I can question them and I can find the flaws in them and I can, I can bring up the amendments or like identify what's going on with them without ever even knowing about the topic. Like, I'm getting a lot better at this. It sounds like it. Well, and, and when you're talking about calling these these companies, this is not just like it's, it's not a staffer; it's the representative. You're literally the chair of the energy committee calling these companies up and asking about it. That's it's kind of got to throw some of these secretaries for a little bit of a loop. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, they're like so. If constituents have a problem, I deal with those issues, and so I don't call. And like, I, it's kind of funny being a representative. I call the department head. And I, if my secretary's there, they're like, well, can we do a message? Or can you talk to this person? And I'm like, no, like, literally give me the department head, um, like the chair, like the main person for that department, because I'm going to talk to them. And we're going to work out my constituent, constituent issue, because once they're, they know I have an issue, they tend to fix it really quick. And so it almost makes fixing constituent issues go faster, because they know my eyes are on the ball. And, you know, next time they have a budget come up, they've, they were if they worked easy with me, then I'm not going to be bothered by how poor performance they did. So it's kind of an amazing thing. That is really cool. I tell you what, I'm, I'm becoming more and more a fan of uh, Montana's political system as we talk. I've yeah. I've always been a big fan of Montana on the fly fishing and hunting and just the the place up there. But man, now I'm, I'm loving their uh, loving the way the legislature works. This is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's a lot of volunteer work though. Now, as we're kind of wrapping up here, you know, if you're looking back. You know, a couple of terms ago, you're 25, you're 24 as you get into this race, 25 throughout, you know, when you're getting sworn in. What kind of stuff would you be telling yourself as far as advice going back those couple of years? You know what? I, I'm one of the person, kind of types of person who can, uh, has to do something to learn about it. I, it's, it doesn't make my life easy, I'll tell you this much, because I've made a lot of mistakes, but then I learn and see it. I can't read about it. If someone tells me about it, it wouldn't make a difference. I still got to do it one way or another. The first thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. The first thing I did was I um I made sure a lot of lobbyists knew that I didn't really care for them, which is a negative or a positive. It's very because we have low donation limits, so the impact of with relationships with them is a lot lower, you could say here than right. in other states. So um, I let them know that, and it it was um I just want to let them know like there is a regard here, and their opinion is not uh, number one of importance in my eyes. And it created quite the conflict. And then the second session came up, and you know, it was a, I calmed down a little bit. I kind of um, took on a few different groups, but not the whole, not the whole hill, <laughs> not the um, entire lobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then my third term came up, and all of a sudden I'm chairing this committee, and I and you know what? They, I would say I wouldn't have changed a thing because I get along with people now, but they also know I'm not there to take anybody's crap. Um, I was. Yeah, I am there to do a job, and if I think they're lying or not telling the truth, they could be a really nice person or not. I'm going to call them out on it, and we are going to get down to the matter. So my reputation long term, I think, has been very beneficial. Um, so I wouldn't change a thing, but you know, I definitely didn't make politics easy for myself at first. Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of setting that tone early. Uh, one of my good friends here in Texas, uh, State Senator Burton, she made a lot of people mad in the first when she first uh, took office because she said that she would not allow she would not take meetings with her or her staff with taxpayer funded lobbyists and you know that really ticked a lot of people off but she's like look this is just a something i have a fundamental problem with and 
these people are not welcome to office. You know, the mayor of whatever city can come down, but I'm not going to let them waste taxpayer dollars trying to send somebody else to come meet with me. We're just not going to do it that way. And setting that tone, it's something that whether they agree with you or not, I think that a lot of folks can respect that position and it, it lets everybody know the ground rules. So it makes it nice and easy. Exactly. And it's better to be like really stern and let loose a little bit than go the opposite direction and be like, absolutely. Buddy and be like, and that's the whole thing is like, I saw the game, however, they, we are a vote, we are a purpose. So like everybody's your buddy and you're really smart to them and everything. I just didn't. I didn't appreciate that. Maybe again, is the Russian cynicism, but like, I don't like to <laughs> how smart I am. Um, I, I don't. It doesn't. It, that that doesn't make me feel good. You know, I know that there's an end goal, so I wouldn't have changed a thing because now people know where I'm coming from, and I've actually loosened up a lot. I get along with people a lot better. I probably respect some of them a lot more because I understand the difficulties they face as well. But if if they do one thing like that I think is untrustworthy or wrong or they're screwing people over, they will know it and they know it. So they are even more cautious around me. So I, again, set the tone and uh, I'm very happy I did it. Well, where can people find you online if they want to get in touch and uh, you know you know reach out and bother you about different stuff? Uh, my Facebook, uh, I have a political one that's facebook.com uh, slash Daniel. Zolnikov, or uh, you can do Daniel Zolnikov, Z O L N I K O V, uh, which is at or DanielZolnikov.com. And uh, I mean, basically, my name is everywhere. It's on my Twitter, it's on my Instagram. Twitter is Daniel Zolnikov. It's really nice having my last name because uh, all those handles are never taken up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is probably pretty hard for people to, to forget the name. Once they actually figure out how to pronounce it and they get that down, I doubt many people forget it. So that's it's pretty helpful when it comes to Google. Dude, I, I have there's representatives who still call me Zelenikov and Zolski. Like they add, that <laughs> thing to it. yeah, you're right. Once the, once they hear it, they tend not to forget it, which can also be negative too sometimes. <laughs> I hear but, you. Yeah. Having a, having a weird name like Raz kind of has some of the same uh, same problems associated with it. So I, I can feel your pain on that one. Yeah, but that's cool, man. Like you're, you know it better than most. No one's gonna forget it. It definitely helps a lot when it comes to the branding side. Well, you got any closing words of wisdom for the audience? Uh, no, I would just say uh, thank you again for having me. And, um, you know, I guess maybe the one thing I'd leave it with is you, you, most people do their campaign the best in the style that suits their personality, too. So there's all these right ways to do it, of course. And I'll, like, I firmly believe you should knock on doors and things like that. But some people have a little bit different style. So being like for my fundraising, I do a lot of uh, letters. I also ask a lot of people, but like there's different approaches that kind of fit my personality better, which means that when I do it, I'm not resisting it. I'm not trying to find anything else to do. I can dive right in it. That was huge. And so, you know, forming your campaign a little bit around your style, um, not that doesn't mean you get to skip knocking doors or not. <laughs> exactly. But like, it's okay to, like, I think, make a little bit more like fitting to your style. I like to wear jeans on the doors. Some people like to wear shorts. Some people like to wear khakis. Make it your campaign. You know, that is big because then then you can own it. So that's what I'd like to finish with. Well, that's some thank good you. closing advice. I definitely appreciate that. And Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been great to have you on. And uh, I look forward to seeing great stuff coming out of this session for you. And it I, I gives me another excuse to come back up to Montana to get to uh, get to meet you and have a drink sometime. So I look, that forward good, to, uh, I look forward to getting up there and getting to meet you in person. I want to thank you all you listeners for joining in today. And to make sure you check out the show notes for Daniel's content information and the links we mentioned during the show. And we'll talk to you guys again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from my campaign coach.